Welcome back to Data Driven Leadership. I'm your host, Jess Carter, and with me today is Peter Krombach, the Director of Data Operations at the Indiana Department of Health. Hey, Peter. Hi. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you here. This is long overdue. Definitely. We discussed this in March, May. But I've been secretly pleading to be on this for <laughs> years. So We've been secretly pleading for you to be on it for a year. And for you to even say that is sort of a... Um, I don't know, uh, compliment because we've barely been here for a year. Yeah. Um, but you're passionate about data. Mm -hmm. That's why you're excited, right? Yeah, okay. Definitely. Uh, were you, so I'm going to get into this right mm -hmm. away. Uh, were you always interested in data? No. Okay. I feel like it always came naturally, but as any like data thing evolves, I feel like as I continue to get older, I was noticing patterns and okay. behaviors in different aspects of life. Yeah. I always used to think I was going to go into the medical field as like a primary care physician or... Oh, interesting. I mean, first dream was always pediatric oncologist, which is wow. beyond what this scope is. But <laughs> it's kind of being in the right place at the right time okay. has been my professional journey into data. And it just makes sense. Like data is always something that unfortunately sometimes makes sense to people and other times doesn't. And you can yep. train that up. Yeah. But... My data journey has always just been taking the opportunities as they come and okay. just like diving straight in. That's amazing. Can you tell me more about that? Because you have you have this interesting career mm -hmm. where you sort of uh, following it is this fun map into right. where you are today. So can you walk us through that? I use different analogies depending on who I talk to and like how much time I always have to talk about <laughs> yeah. it. But it's always been very non-traditional. Like I don't claim to be a data scientist, don't claim to be a data architect, even though they've been in my job. Sure. Like, that's my job title. Um, credit to people who've just hired me because of my skill set, and I'm proud of that. But yeah. a lot of it is just right place, right time, and evolving with the context that I make and just my interests as they grow. Um, wow. Since traditionally I had background in education as an epidemiologist, getting yeah. my master of public health. But after that, it was, um, hey, we want to introduce you to health informatics. Um, kind of figure out what that was, what SQL and certain data processing right. was, and just ran with it. Um, That's so cool. So everywhere that I've gone, I've gained new skills. And that's kind of something that I've liked in roles where you can learn a new tool. You're not trying to only focus on one methodology. Yeah. Um, and gaining a lot more tools in your tool belt to be able to mm -hmm. consult on that and just help creatively solve solutions. Well, and you've been you've been in health. So like mm -hmm. we're gonna have to unpack. Yeah. Most people may not know what an epidemiologist mm -hmm. is. Well, how would you explain that to so, my grandma? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So the first thing I always say is we are not dermatologists. Um, <laughs> Do you get that we a lot? Used to have, well, because like epidemiology, like it's similar to epidermis in a way. Sure. And so we used to have these little, wanted to make stickers being like, we are not skin doctors. We cannot <laughs> consult on your mole. Um, but I just like to say we are individuals who are passionate about monitoring diseases and identifying areas where there may be populations that are disproportionately affected. Yeah. So, I mean, you go back to um, the initial cholera outbreak with the evolution of um, Jon Snow and the actual Jon Snow, who actually was a person, um, <laughs> and the Broad Street water pump. Um, okay. Just surveying outbreaks and saying, hey, we're good at counting things. Can we turn that into, instead of counting individual groups, yeah. the entire population? And so yeah. that's kind of evolved into the population health aspect. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit similar to the medical field because, yes, we do consult with physicians and our sure. commissioner is a physician herself. So there is that play in between utilizing these broad population view. OK. At the same time. So um, so you're not you can't look at a mole and evaluate yes. it, but you can help public health better understand what diseases, mm -hmm. new or, you know, continuing diseases, we can track them, trend them, exactly. and understand how they're impacting public health mm -hmm. more generally and specific people groups. Exactly. Okay. And a lot of it is we're just a resource to use to consult because some of these physicians, unless you're like an infectious disease doctor, may not see this in their career. Right. So, oh, I have a case of an uh, gast a GI illness that sure. I never have seen before. What am I responsible for reporting? So we can do, whether it's from reporting or disease prevention mechanisms or just saying, hey, this is a problem. Let's yeah. try to figure out a way to address it. Do you feel like the entire world finally knew what you did during the pandemic? <laughs> In a way, it also felt like validating as like, oh, is this like by just chance that I right. was always like secretly dreaming of a pandemic and never wanting it to happen? <laughs> um, because like when you used to when I used to have to explain what an epidemiologist was, it was kind of trying to convince myself that I knew what it was because 
some epidemiologists don't really deal with data all the time. They're just a very consultant and deal mm -hmm. with the prevention aspects, but then others do have those skills. Wow. So suddenly it mattered. Yeah. To everyone. And everyone had an opinion on what it should be and right. how we should present data. Um, and of course, that was always waters that you have to navigate as a leader, just trying to understand, OK, how can we mitigate any potential um, yeah. negative feedback that we would get? But it's kind of embracing that at Absolutely. the same time. Yeah, I mean, that's how you that's how you iterate through maturity, right? right. Is we actually collect that feedback and figure out how to make better mm -hmm. visuals or better explanations right. of what we're doing, right? Right. Um, well, and that seems like so one of the questions I have is in in your role, so you've played a lot, you've, you've kind of had mm -hmm. multiple roles. We're, we're yep. going back to your whole story. Yeah. So you've had these multiple roles in public sector health mostly, mm -hmm. right? Um, but around data. Yep. And so, but not all at the same agency. You weren't right. always at Department of Health. Where were you before? So I started out at the Department of Health and that was like, I've had three instants there okay. in different roles. This is my fourth one total. <laughs> but I've also had experience um, at Indiana University Got doing clinical research, um, helping be a data manager over there. And then I was also doing a similar capacity for the School of Nursing okay. um, at IU in Indianapolis. Um, and always just my go to bread and butters is like, I like helping people yeah. find solutions to problems in a way where they never thought was possible because whether they've always had that mantra, I've always done it this way, this is what works. Right. Um, and just trying to show that value of, hey, I can potentially automate this process for you so you don't have to spend 40 hours a week and yeah. I can just run this report for you in an hour. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I fit in. Great. Um But the thing that's been the common theme is just being able to look ahead and not wanting to settle with the minimum and just be like, hey, I know there's, even if I don't know the way myself, right. let's try to figure it out together um, and move forward and try to embrace the fear of failure. Yeah. So, well, tell me more about that. So, I've been in public sector consulting for almost a decade, mm -hmm. and there is certainly, I mean, there's real elements that are different than private. There are right. elections that come up, there's more fear of what if something gets in the paper. We want to take care of public uh, citizens, we want to make sure that we're taking, we're, we're responsibly managing mm -hmm. dollars. So, I think there's a lot of reasons to be afraid. Right. Right. right? So, how do you navigate that in, in an environment that is, kind of full of fear. Mm -hmm. It's it's all about like the opposite of fear is like trying to build trust and confidence yeah. that we're all working on that shared mission. Whether we don't have the understanding of what this individual does to contribute to that task like holistically, we are all responsible for the same deliverable. Um, mm. I find it fantastic that everyone likes to take ownership of the products that we release. And that's something that I encourage everyone to focus on is like, hey, there may be potential snags or roadblocks that we hit, but we're trying yeah. to focus on that core goal. Um, the fear part is just not wanting to have any negative feedback directly on you because sure. from a liability perspective, it never feels good as a professional right. to have that negative feedback. And it's like, oh, is my job going to be at risk? Is someone going to say something that we'll get in trouble for? Right. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, it does happen, but it's trying to frame it in a way where you can move on from it because, yes, we are in the public sector. So every mistakes that are made are made very public and right. can potentially have consequences. But hopefully you just need to lean into that and try to move on and like craft that narrative mm -hmm. um, about, yes, we understand and own that mistake and understand that that happened and say, these are the steps that we're doing to mitigate that. It's a big deal. I mean, yeah. that, that is a um, the risks the healthy risks mm -hmm. an agency can take to transform right. are just significantly different if you have that mindset. Exactly. If you're if if anytime you're in the paper, anytime there's a negative outcome that's in the public eye, mm -hmm. we failed. Right. You will actually hamper innovation in your agency. I exactly. don't know that everybody realizes that. And that's something that the pandemic taught us and we're trying to continue to sustain that model of Yes, we know that these roadblocks exist. Yeah. Let's not try to go back to our old ways just because we're not in an emergency anymore. Wow. So let's try to like work together. And a lot of it for us is like top down leadership, just trying to lead by example. Um, because I always just like, I need to own my mistakes if I make one. Right. And so hopefully those who um whether it's reporting to me or just work with me can feel that same way. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's always depending on the person, it's very person centric and not procedure centric because the procedures can come and go, but it's really trying to build that collaborative trust between everyone in your agency. How, 
it surprises me that you would say that COVID helped bring that to bear. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like in COVID, the opposite could also be true, where you're so terrified to make mm -hmm. a mistake right. that nothing. So unpack how, I don't know, I'm, I'm intrigued about how um, COVID allowed for um, more of this vulnerability right. as an agency. How did that happen, do you think? I think it was a blessing and a curse in terms of uh, I came at it from a different perspective. Like I wasn't there at the beginning, but I came in in May as kind of like the support staff okay. for the CDC Foundation as a data scientist. So I have a different view on that, but I think it just caused us to actually stop and say, okay, we literally have to drop everything that we're doing and everyone in the agency is supporting one common task. I see. And so we had so many barriers that because we weren't just doing our day-to-day -day work yeah. that were just highlighted. And so of okay. course, having the pu Governor's Public Health Commission and doing these broad scale assessments, that helped of course, but I think it was just the, oh crap, we have to do something brand new. Yeah. We can't really use old processes because we tried to surf that over, right. not necessarily not worked for that solution. So it right. forced us to innovate. And I think that was okay. a good thing. Well, and you were, so you've said this twice, but to, to emphasize it, because I think it's significant, um, y you found, you found a way to align everyone to a common goal or mm -hmm. mission. Right. It was, I mean, I remember even the concept of most data people are mm -hmm. not in the business where they're gonna get a chance to actually reduce right. um, outcomes for people that might be deceased mm -hmm. based on a, a, a pandemic. And so there's right. a sense of, you can actually make a significant difference that you never knew you were gonna be able to make in your career. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be super unifying. Right. So the sense of, we're not worried about these reports over here right now. We are trying, we're actually in the business Mm -hmm. of saving lives in a, right. in a pandemic. We're normally in the business of saving lives, mm -hmm. but like seriously in an emergent, right. urgent, you know, emergency situation. To me, that has the power to really unite people. Definitely. Did you guys, do you feel like you sense that as an agency? We did. I think it okay. took a little bit because everyone just with burnout and just how professional nature was, yeah. you were working around the clock. It's hard to yeah. celebrate those wins because of everything that's happening around you. Um, from what I've seen just aftermath, I think that we're just tr continuing to try to sustain that, really encourage people, of course, trying to mitigate burnout and do what we can with yeah. workforce development. But um, I think it's been positive, um, at least from the data perspective. Good. Well, and what about, so I think about your career and you have been, you've done a lot in, mm. in a small number of hours or years. And so when I look at your career, do you have any thoughts about, um, I think it'd be easy to be sort of at the right place at the right time, yep. but not have the right mindset, mm -hmm. be in your head about, do I have the right to say something? Right. Do I have the right? So I don't know if you would normally call yourself a risk taker, but it seems like you've kind yeah. of leaned in. So I'm very risk averse in my personal life, okay. but professionally, I think it's just learning to trust your gut instinct because everyone has one, um, but the fear internally that we've talked about and just like the imposter syndrome like am i qualified enough to do this that everyone yeah. goes through because like i talk to my siblings or talk to other professionals and it's like yeah i do feel that same way right but everyone just has a different way of addressing that and for me it is the understanding of if i don't know something be that first be like your own advocate and yeah. ask those questions and admit hey i'm not going to be able to do this i need some additional training right um okay so that's kind of been my mindset. It's just trying to, like I was saying, like lean into it all and just, um, of course, just address that fear and try to move through it. Because yeah. of course there's days where I'm still stressed out about something that's going on. Yeah. And it takes that second to step back and say, okay, clear your mind and just focus on that end goal. Do you know how enjoyable it is to hear someone on a data podcast say, trust your gut? Mm -hmm. Because it is, it's easy to, to get into this spiral of I need data to be a data-driven leader, and that means I have to have just the right reports. And mm -hmm. there was a reality in some of these instances where you didn't have all the data you needed, right. and you had to make a decision. And so there's, right. this is where it's still data to call mm -hmm. to your experience, right. or to call to some to borrow someone else's lens or experience. It's not just that everything has to be in a dashboard perfectly, exactly. right? And so that's where my again, imposter syndrome can show up for me when. I think everyone else is more technical than me. Mm -hmm. Everyone else has, probably has more data than me. Right. And the the, re, the point is you're in the room. Like you're the person assigned to lead mm -hmm. the data organization and you understand what decisions need to be made. Right. It's your and job. Be confident that people who are in leadership positions are looking to you and are actually like, even if they're not directly telling you all the time that they trust in you to do a good job. And yeah. you wouldn't be there unless you are meant to be there. Yeah. Did you have, um, 
I mean, for real, it's easy to look back and mm -hmm. say that. Do you remember a specific instance or two where you you were going into a meeting and it was, whether it was the pandemic or something else, and you kind of had to walk yourself through this? Mm -hmm. You do? So <laughs> I was thrown into the deep end a little bit right away okay. um, because as we were noticing, yes, the elderly population and those in long-term care facilities were really focused, were really right. um, advert or at risk right. of um, additional negative consequences, whether that's hospitalization or unfortunately death. Right. And we needed a better way to track that. Okay. And so I um, was voluntold or just took that position of, okay, we need to collect data from all of our healthcare facilities that focus on long-term care or yeah. nursing homes. And then we need to have a mechanism for reporting that moving forward to be able to have a surveillance dashboard around sure. that. And so like not an hour later, I was already on a call with a couple of execs, whether both from resultant and the state government. She's like, okay, how are we gonna do this? Sure. And I didn't have that idea. I was like, I'm just gonna own it. This is a way that we have that I know may work. Um, let me investigate a little bit more yeah. and just kind of drive forward. Um, and of course, I would want it to be a team approach. In that case, it was individual, just sure. checking the initiative to go. Yeah. But the f support that I felt from everyone else that was participating, um, whether that's individuals on the engineering team that actually used the data that I was collecting and cleaning, yeah. or just from the executive per perspective that were trusting in the decisions that I made, mm. helped make that a little bit easier. Yeah, it's this, um, it's interesting to me to hear you even replay that and think at some point, like the two words that greeted me were you were open and you were willing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you were willing to get on the call, you were open about ideas you had, right. and you weren't, going to be easily offended if someone else had a better one. Right. It was just about the outcome. So you were tied to the mission. You were trying to accomplish things. You were open and willing, not defensive, not my idea has to be right. Definitely. Right. It wasn't about this is Peter's time to shine. It was mm -hmm. like, let's just help everybody. Right. <laughs> That's really, I mean, that is an interesting way to overcome imposter syndrome, that it's not about believing you are amazing. Mm -hmm. The the antidote to imposter syndrome might be being willing and open right. to participating in the solution, not necessarily being just suddenly so egotistical mm -hmm. that you know you're great. <laughs> right. Because I used to think, oh, you know you've made it if you're going to be that big leader who can be willing to speak in front of a group and like own it and like say, yes, this is what my agency did. Right. But it's finding those ways. And if you're not in that role, just knowing how you contribute and st still looking for those opportunities, of course, where you can show your skill set. Yeah. But at different times, like leadership and data, specific leadership means different things to different people. Right. And you find successful, like actual good leaders in positions where they will never see the spotlight. And that's something that they're okay with, but they're still excellent leaders. Right. I like that you just made the concept too of a data driven leader is accessible by anyone. Mm -hmm. You can be a data driven leader by having a sense for the right. highest and best use of yourself today and leveraging yourself mm -hmm. in that way. Like I, I think there's some self-management there too, right? Right. And it's to your point, it's not about the limelight, right. it's about impact. And just because I have the director in my title or someone would have a chief in their title, that they just play a different role in our entire data landscape. Um, yeah that they they may be able to go back and do like develop a model as a right. data scientist or run some analytics but they're that's not the role that they're playing at that point yeah. so it's all just again trying to focus on that team based approach i like that the the team the team emphasis too i think takes some of the ego out mm -hmm. it's all about what are we trying to accomplish right that's cool um so when you look at the last half decade though mm -hmm. the last three years probably feel like yeah. an eternity <laughs> Um, do you, um, there it's, it, I kind of feel like you've seen these moments where you've, you've managed and harnessed data for specific use cases, mm -hmm. but there's now this pretty large change. It's like a wave coming over state government where data is really being seen as an asset. Right. It's not just a data project mm -hmm. with this one set of data and this one research. It's how do we manage the asset that right. is our data? Right. Uh, I guess I would ask you in that journey, like what has surprised you? along that journey? Um, I think it's just the continued commonalities that everyone has that mutual understanding of, hey, we know something about data. They might not be exclusively data literate that they can be able to explain the complex processes, yeah. but they still try to, are wanting to be willing to understand it. Sure. Um, and I think it's just instances where you see kind of both sides of the spectrum where 
the historically in just any data system, there's specific data silos that always exist. And you have some projects where people are willing to say, let's just completely break down the walls, blow it all up yeah. and create this new model. But then you try to leverage that against individuals like, oh, this process has always been the way it does. It works well. But trying that to do that forward thinking, yeah. to use it as an asset to say, hey, I understand that you collect that data in one system, but look at all these other possibilities that we can do with the data that will then positively impact your program. So it's just trying to balance both sides to mm -hmm. say, yes, we will set up the governance that's necessary for everyone to use this as a shared asset, to build that trust and like to mitigate their fears of it being misused or right. inappropriately yeah. used um, with let's build that trust enough for you guys to be okay with us assessing. Right. Because it's pretty critical information. Like we're talking about an individual's health record at times. Right. And so, of course, everyone is on the same page as we just need to align back at that is we are committed to protecting and promoting the health of all Hoosiers. And that includes keeping the information confidential and like making sure that we have the right checks in place for the metrics that we deliver. That is eloquently said. We want to access it, but we also want to protect it and leverage it for the right mm -hmm. right outcomes. Um, okay, so you mentioned governance, which I've sort of mm -hmm. been enjoying having a conversation about yeah. governance with a few people on the podcast because I think that it is a it is a little bit of I don't know. My observation is it seems like governance is more and more of um, like it depends on who you're talking to. Right. What do you mean? So when it comes to leveraging data and putting together a governance structure. Mm -hmm. What's been the hardest part in your opinion? Um, that's a great question because like the first, when I was recruited back to IDOH for the fourth cent <laughs> um, from FSSA, my original title was just director of engagement and governance. And okay. so I was tasked with helping to build out our executive data governance board that we have. Yeah. And that's a like, like you said, governance means a lot of different things to depending on who you ask. Yeah. Um, a lot of the struggles that I've worked through is just balancing the necessary policies and procedures and security that you're required, of course, to stay federally compliant right. in these systems that were made for a reason. Um, because for me, they're just hard to interpret, like a security policy with yes. a bunch of additional acronyms to understand. Um, but it's also trying to incorporate Governance also can mean developing best practices, whether it's being a center of excellence for business intelligence or data and analytics. Yeah. But it's giving individuals the tools to say, hey, we're gonna, we're not telling you what to do. It's just here are all the options to expand that scope mm. um, and like drop pushing them in the right direction. Because like governance to me can be those like metal bars that you can't move out of, whether right. it's a guardrail or what analogy you want to use. But I also think it's just building your boat a little bit bigger to be able to say, oh, you might not have known that this tool is accessible right. or this analytical method is there, but built in within our governance, whether it's a better focus on data quality yeah. or a better focus on, let's make sure our analytics are automated. It just means absolutely making it all encompassing. Yeah, there's this pivot I saw from uh, data, um, data, I would say like data projects to data products mm -hmm. in the sense of re what's repeatable. Right. And how do we, how do we, if, let's govern the things that are repeatably useful. But to your point, I really appreciate the emphasis too on that data was created for a reason in a source system and making sure we understand the intents and purposes mm -hmm. of that system that we're honoring what that data was supposed to right. be used for. Um, is also also that's hard to govern. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make sure that there's traceability between the data that exists, Definitely. the metadata around it, and its original intent, and whether we can use it for these other things. Right. Um, and then also figuring out uh, how do you paint that picture for people who want to leverage data. How do you help them see? I picture almost like a Whole Foods or something. Mm -hmm. You're walking down a shopping aisle and you're looking to solve a big complex problem. How do right. you just understand that there's a few more aisles when it comes to, I, I still know people who think that every time they need new data, they have to update their source system with right. a new field. And I'm like, well, hang on, you might have that data somewhere else. And there's just interoperability opportunities, mm -hmm. but then they're they're asking what interoperability means. So right. there's just this, this challenge of it's maturing quickly. There's amazing potential outcomes and value. And the literacy piece is so yep. critical that I think it's that's a lot to juggle. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's like trying to have conversations as early as you can, because mm -hmm. 
given the nature of public health, we can sometimes be reactionary in nature. Like with COVID, we had to be reactionary right. because we didn't know what it was. And so we were just reacting to the new thing. Right. But in principle, public health is supposed to be proactive population health. Yeah. And so that's something that I think translates well into any data product that you develop because um, one solution is not always not one size fits all. Right. But it can be repeatable. So it's just like, as long as you try to engage the data professionals or whatever name you want to give them as early as you can in your process, not to try to dictate what goes on, but just say, here is the art of the possible. Yeah. And then talk through it and have that all the stakeholders at the table to say, hey, we will try to translate as best we can and help you understand some of the engineering that is too complex really to right. write out or communicate in a one line email. Um, but right. we do have that shared vision again to deliver the most useful product to your team. Yeah. Well, and that combo too, I'm curious what you think about this. So, you know, your um, energy is spent on data, data. Mm -hmm. It's usefulness, effectiveness, governance, engagement, yep. right? Literacy. You really can't do that without IT. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting too to realize like those two have to marry. Definitely. And there are times where the biggest challenge in a data solution isn't the data, it's how it's interoperable. Or it's mm -hmm. the IT where it's like right. we actually have to support each other to reach these amazing outcomes. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've experienced too? Yeah. And I think it was a good test because like our ops of data analytics was invented, well, like rebranded, I guess you could say, sure. during the pandemic itself. Okay. But we do have like an intimate working relationship with our IT organization, whether it's lo um, internally in yeah. our Office of Technology and Cybersecurity or even with just the state Indiana Office of Technology. Right. Um, and a lot of it is just what they bring to the table is that really technical privacy security lens yes. that we have to follow and give us those good guardrails. But they also give us the knowledge of, hey, this is the current state of this information system because right. they are the subject matter experts. Um, and I think the things that I thought have been amazing partnership ideas is when you talk about data quality, they know, oh, th we can't change this yet because we have to go, we might have to go through an extra step um, to reach out to a vendor to get the source system changed. Yep. Um, and so that's not necessarily like that it's not a solution. Right. It just brings that extra lens to show um, because sometimes people think that, I always like to say like, we're not magicians, we're, we're data professionals. <laughs> and so um, using that literacy component is saying, hey, this is everything that goes into this process. Um, so it, it can't just be like a light switch. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's really important because I think a lot of people will just try and run with their data and they end up with a whole bunch of technical right. debt because they either left their IT department in a wake yep. behind them and built a bunch of stuff that they didn't know they'd have to support one day right. and the IT department didn't know how. And right. so there's this piece too of how can you be the high tide that raises all boats? Mm -hmm. And that really is this combo. And you've done, I think, again, a great job sort of speaking in harmony about the business objectives, mm -hmm. mission, outcomes and the data, right? Um, like the data should be driven by the mission. But then there's this IT department too, that is this core foundation of how it's all done. Exactly. And I think those three are in some kind of acute triangle on probably somebody's documentation mm -hmm. about how critical they are. <laughs> and too, like it also focuses on, because our success as an agency, of course, is to improve the population's health and try to make people live as long as possible and as fruitful as they can be. Right. But at the same time, um, there's just challenges that you go into because the products that you build may be requested by an individual and then go away. So you try to mitigate that as much as you can because yeah. especially now in this modernization era and trying to talk about interoperability, you really need to just have purpose-driven data products right. and not just, oh, I need this analysis complete now. Right. Uh, the, like, because ad hoc requests will never go away, yeah. but it's building in those components of collaboration that will continue to sustain that product, whether it is a dashboard or um, some other procedure yeah. to be used holistically long term. Yeah, you've probably been in this situation, too, where I think about people who are drowning in data requests mm -hmm. and they don't even understand why people are asking half the ones they're asking. Right. And I mean, in a private sector would be like our board. Like if they came and they were asking us a bunch of questions and we're wrestling to get the data together, one of the first things I want to know is, do should we already know the answer to that question? Right. <laughs> like is that should we be operating and managing our business in a way where we can we can rattle off the answer to that question? Or are they asking because it's a one time thing? And so I'm sure you guys have some of that too, where it's hey, what data does someone need? Why do they think they need it? 
Is there a better way to get it to them to, or to help them with their mm -hmm. outcome? But that's back to good data-driven leadership exactly. isn't just the request process. It's also communication. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure we actually understand each other and what right. we're trying to do. And we've talked about it in terms of like change management. It's just like you always have to talk about the why. Yeah. And for me, that has always driven my professional career because I've stayed in public service because I have that shared why. Right. And yeah, data is the extra bonus that helps me stay because it's a awesome thing that lets us do innovative th um, just projects yeah. in general. Yeah. So being able to sit to start with why. Yeah, I think there's a book that I'm, I have on my it desk. Starts with start why. with why. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm maybe that's been imprinted on my brain for a while. But that is something that I pride myself on doing. That's awesome. Um, also, it made me laugh the two times that you said this is your fourth stint. Yeah. Uh, you reminded me very few people know this, but I may or may not have been a Cracker Barrel waitress. Does that shock you? No, no, probably not. Um, and I would always joke that I had three stars. If I had four, it meant I was there for too long. And so that was like my like go-to yeah. joke when people would say like, I'm gonna get you a fourth star. And I was like, you can't really get me a fourth star. It has to do with training I haven't gone through. Um, but it made me laugh to think about um, even some of the like the, when we talked about imposter syndrome and some of the things about how do you handle your career when mm -hmm. it's growing this quickly too? Right. And the ability to just say like, I love that I'm open, I'm willing, we're gonna try to help, I'm tied to the mm -hmm. mission. And it seems like the team piece, you're very thoughtful. So Peter, I might ask you about this. Yeah. You're very thoughtful. Like when you talk about team, you're good about thinking about who's everyone that needs to win. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think you've, did you learn that through stepping in it someday? Or have you always sort of been oriented towards making sure you really appreciate who's everyone on mm -hmm. the team? That's a great question, because I think that is the one of the correlations that does transfer into my personal life mm. is I used to I used to tie my happiness to others opinions of me, mm -hmm. of course, as every individual does who has like is an empathetic driven person. Yes. But it morphed into just knowing that you care about the success of others. And yes, at times I prioritize I used to say I prioritize my happiness with others happiness. But in the professional sphere, it's flipping that mindset and saying, I am not successful unless the people around me are successful because I'm not being a good leader if we're not delivering good products. I love that. Um, I can get more promotion and promotion and like focus on, oh, here are the wins, but it's actually saying, am I building up my team to yeah. take over for me if I go away? Hmm. And I think that that is something that I, I wish I wish you were a magician and you could help everybody because I think that is 90% of problems I see right. around data and tech are not data. They're not tech. Mm -hmm. They're people problems. Exactly. And if people understood that you were inherently on their team when we first started the project, I just think a lot of those problems go away. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting. And yeah. it's how we communicate it too because like trying to loop in literacy as like a, a theme, yeah. it's some people are just very afraid because they don't feel confident in their skills. So just like, what can you do to make sure um, that everyone is on the same shared understanding? And yeah. I think that helps projects because people learn and communicate in much different ways. Yeah. And so you have to always be thinking of the multiple different approaches that you have, even if it is on the same project to have everyone have that shared understanding. Yeah. And I think to me, that is like what I pin success on at times is because if like our data and analytics team would get pulled in a different priority, a program area may have to um, support this technology or vice versa. Right. So if there's not that shared understanding, then we're not successful again. Yeah. Do you have like one piece of advice on how somebody could quite pragmatically take a step toward creating that kind of a culture if they kind of if they self realize we're not there? Right. How how do I take one practical step toward that kind of culture or dynamic? That's a great question. Um, for me, it's just trying to find innovative ways to have business be exposed to technology and data and analytics and vice versa. Mm. So a project that I thought was very successful that I'll credit um, one of my old coworkers, Courtney Lambert with is, yeah. we called it our pie in the sky project. Okay. So we worked with our infectious disease team, paired um, individuals who were interested on the epidemiology side with someone on our office of data analytics team. Okay. And so they worked on a shared project. And so they collaborated not only on the presentation that they gave, but then also all the coding and development of their research outcome okay. at the same time. And so we were just trying to think of methods of how, since we don't have enough hours in the day, some some weeks sure. to be able to do that, how can we just allow individuals to shadow someone? So say, oh, business, you know, just come with me 
oh, on my cool. regular day and sit there as I code and just try to explain what a day looks like. That's so neat. And I wish I could do that. I would love to just be like, can I shadow each of our 42 different division directors and see yeah. what they do on a daily basis? So it's trying to break that down into what projects could you do that gives you a little bit of a window into that lens. That's super neat. It, it's, um, it's like a bit of... Um, programmatic cognitive empathy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's always that balance. Like you can sometimes, like in my aspect, I was a public health professional that just leaned in and learned these data skills on the fly. Like, yes, of course, I was blessed to have the ability to take that on very quickly. Yeah. And then you have individuals who are on the data side that you're trying to learn public health and maybe a hard concept for them to grasp. Right. And I think just trying to find opportunities to blend those two together and empower not only the subject matter experts mm -hmm. to just have some proficiency with these concepts um, and vice versa. Because wow. ideally, like these unicorn candidates, as you call them, yeah. or we at least term yeah. them, I don't necessarily like label myself as a unicorn. I'm just like, I'm here for the ride. Sure. Um, but trying <laughs> to find people that have the blend of those skills not only are they hard to identify, they sometimes can be hard to retain because they're a, right. a, they're like liquid gold to any um, yes. particular agency. So it's trying to say, how can we train and sustain these individuals across the board to have that program area competency yeah. and the data competency that as well. Is such a good idea. I mean, that's basically a masterclass in how do you help break down silos, period. Right. So that I think it's so cool. OK, my, maybe my last question. Yeah. I reserve the right to look at these. <laughs> See what I'm asking anymore. Um, if you had one wish, if there was mm -hmm. a magician we both had yeah. met, and they could they could grant, or I guess it would be a genie, one wish for you in in the state, in public sector, in health and mm -hmm. data, but they only granted one, what wish would you ask for? I would say like a friend's answer and just be, I'd have a million, uh, grant me un unlimited wishes after that <laughs> so then I could solve all the problems. Because I feel like, I forget what the, it was like, oh, if I was omnipotent for a day, I'd be omnipotent forever. <laughs> but for me, I don't know. I think because I don't think that there is that magic potion to solve it. It's because it's a person thing and right. people have these different opinions. I think, um, I don't know. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think for me, it comes down to the people. So it was just like, how can we unite together yeah. in that common cause? And so maybe it is just that moment that it has of instead of wanting one solution because you can have unlimited funding and still make mistakes right. or have a measly budget but still figure out how to work it yeah just continue to be blessed with a long like a team that sticks around forever and has that good camaraderie because yeah um so yeah maybe i'll just say my wish would be to have that good data-driven culture that makes everyone want to stay and make each other better yeah what i just heard was you want peace on earth probably <laughs> i mean because like i like drama more than anyone else and of course there's always going to be conflicts but i don't know at the heart of it we all have a shared mission and yeah. that is to make everyone else better yeah and so trying to i'm always a advocate of this is like yes I can get in ruts where I'm very pessimistic and right. don't think things are very optimistic. But at the end of the day, inherently, you want to see the good in others. Right. And even from a professional standpoint, I think with data is just like, we want to get the best outcomes we can. And that starts with using data as a strategic asset. Yeah. And then the rest will hopefully come later, but then continuing to build that culture of trust between everyone else. Yeah, you basically, I mean, you somehow you've avoided saying human centric mm -hmm. when this entire conversation, right. like your leadership style is obviously very human centric. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's genius because if you, it's hard to convince people that that matters, mm -hmm. but once they do, it's like a superpower. Right. And so it's it's just interesting to me to to talk to have a conversation with someone who's who's so data savvy, mm -hmm. and it still comes back to it's about the people. Right. Every time it's it's actually about the people. And I think that's just something that luckily I've had an innate knack for that I've tried to continue to sustain because I will admit to anyone like I am a data professional, but like I'm dangerous enough to potentially make a mistake, and I think. Certain individuals who are in the data sphere struggle with potential leadership positions because they get away from what they want to do. Right. And I want to code every day. I want to build a dashboard. Right. And that still is being a data leader. It's because they're knowing their place and their limitations. And yeah. for me, I think I had to learn to feel confident with not doing that regular basis or doing data work, if you can say that on a regular sure. basis, and creating that new data work where it is trying to be that people organizer that relates to someone on a personal level. Um, because I don't know, um, for me, maybe it's just the generation that we grew up in, but 
I try to bring as much personality as I can to the professional yeah. sphere to try to not necessarily be the one be like, oh, you can wear jeans and sandals all day and you don't have to wear a, a suit. Right. But trying to bring as much personal life as you can, but still have that balance where you can find those levels of, of separation when it comes to yeah. like reporting structure at least. But yeah, I, I don't know. I like to mitigate awkward cringy moments even though we like to talk about them i love that and so awkward, cringy moments. that's just like because i don't know we used to say in conversations with people like you don't want those minutes of silence and sometimes it's okay if you ask a hard question people yeah. are thinking about it right especially now in our hybrid work environment but i just try to inject a little bit of me yeah into everyday life even meetings where like asking hey what song is stuck in your head today or our question that we had today in one of our meetings is raise your hand if you are someone who dances in the elevator when no one when you're by yourself <laughs> and then do you get paranoid that the, the elevator camera is watching you <laughs> and my answer is always yes i am the one that does that so it's just those little things that i think help make data less intimidating yes yes it, it helps um because you're right i think it's easy to forget that that it, it is really intimidating for some people i don't think i I don't think I remember that often. Mm -hmm. um, and so to make sure that we're constantly approachable, it seems right. like you're generating this approachability, mm -hmm. which I think is really neat. Um, but there's also just this, like, I remember before I grew up a bit that I was the one that was like at work early mm -hmm. and I had meetings scheduled at 8 a.m. on the dot and all these things. Right. And I, you know, I, I will admit, like then I had kids that had to go to daycare and I I just wish I could go back five years and buy everyone a, qui a quiet mm -hmm. cup of coffee and just set it on their desk that right. had a kid. Like it was like, hey, this is this is actually hard. Juggle like suddenly you don't just have work. You have to mm -hmm. get kids over somewhere and drop. And I just right. I had this, man, I did not have any empathy for parents who were working with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like they deserved 15 to 20 minutes at least of just a quiet, let me sit, because it hasn't been quiet for right. them. And so what are all the different stages of life the team around me is going through? What are the things I don't know even mm -hmm. that they might be going through? And how do we just make things human? How do we make exactly. it easier for them to work? Because you'll get the right outcomes out of people if they actually feel and are truly cared for. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's also, if, if you ever had somebody who sort of checked that box, like, I've cared for you now today, Peter, can we get on? It's <laughs> right. so inauthentic. Right. And people can tell, everyone can tell. The people who are not great at people can tell that it was inauthentic. And so that's hard too, mm -hmm. right? Well, cause like, I think not to knock anyone in the IT space, cause I'm in the IT space. Sure. You can be a little bit more introverted, but introversion necessarily doesn't mean that you're not a people person. Right. And so like flipping that label, but yeah, it's moving away from, okay, we had an icebreaker today, that's good. Okay, everyone, <laughs> yes. let's, let's have it in the introduction. Like, I love them, I will try to come up with icebreakers myself, but like, yeah. that's not the only thing that can make a meeting right. personable. Right. Um, do you have, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but yeah. I'm just curious. Do you have like one more? Like if it's not an icebreaker, what's something else someone can do to make their meeting more So personable? the things that I do is always around music just because. <laughs> You're I don't super know. into music? Well, I am in terms of, I just have a knack of like always having a song stuck okay. in my head. And so something that I thought was super successful that I'm trying to do, it just takes a lot of legwork to organize yeah. is when you have these breakout groups, whether you're in a collaborative meeting, you have everyone go away while you're waiting to be assigned to a group then you have a song that plays and then you have to vote on what the song title and artist is. So just like oh, cool. having like, oh, so one of the themes that I did, I think I did like female artists from each decade from the 70s to 2010 oh my gosh. and just had people vote. Um, they got like candy at the end that's if they won. That's so creative. But it's just something that's small because it injects a little bit of me and my, what my passions yeah. are to try to share those with others. When it's, I am so excited and thankful you're here today because I think that this is a very different unique take on the podcast where we've talked about some of the concrete stuff people are used to mm -hmm. governance and strategy and team unitedness but there's so much more of an emphasis on this human-centered leadership mm -hmm. of data that i think is actually the special sauce right and you can build a zillion technical solutions but no one i mean one of the things i say is i mean peter you've been the person that no matter what resultant has built, mm -hmm. um, you're the person in the agency that's so passionate about putting it to use. Right. And I'm like, otherwise that could sit on shelves and it wouldn't be valuable. Exactly. It would be potentially valuable. So I just, I get excited that you walked us through a whole bunch of special sauce today. So thank you. And the work never goes away. But no, the it pe doesn't. The people change. And I think that's why the biggest change is people. So Absolutely. if we can get that good camaraderie, even if you have a lot of turnover yeah. or whatnot, then you have a culture that people jump Definitely. in and they kind of get it. Yeah. And you'll want to recruit new talent and be like, yes, I want to work for the Department of Health. I That's want to right. help. 
be in public service longer. It is truly a genius move. I, I love it. Well played, both because it's sincere, but yeah. also because it is right. a smart strategy. It's both of those things. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jess Carter. And don't forget to follow the Data Driven Leadership wherever you get your podcasts. Rate and review, letting us know how these data topics are transforming your business. We can't wait for you to join us on the next episode.